Monty was in his element. He'd been given two American armies. What they needed was a general who'd really take charge. He did get out to see his troops. He was very close to the front. A lot of American generals were nice, comfortable chateaus when Monty was right up near the front with his caravan getting out and seeing what was going on. I give him that, and I think that is a very important thing to remember about Monty. He was a professional, and even though he was a ready pain, to, even to those very close to him, what was underneath was, was a guy who knew how to win a battle. Monty quickly brought Hitler's offensive to a halt. Within days, he forced the Germans to retreat. He had saved the Americans in their hour of need, but Monty could not resist telling the world what he'd done. In the middle of the battle, he called a press conference. We all trooped into a little yellow church uh, where they had set up uh, folding chairs and there was a platform at one end uh, and a map of the, the military area uh, on the wall and back. And uh, pretty soon, uh, the great man came bouncing in uh, wearing a, a great uniform. He had on a, um, a red paratrooper's uh, hat uh, with two, only two badges on the hat. Somebody said that was very restrained to Monty. He usually had three or four. And uh, he had on a paratroop cloth jacket over his uh, turtleneck sweater, belted in at the waist very tightly, uh, corduroy slacks, very polished boots. This patronizing cock on a dung hill sort of attitude. He came in in a sort of rightly cocky way, rather sort of taking the line, how do you like my new hat, that sort of thing, which was very off-putting. And he said, we now had a truly marvelous allied effort. And he said, Eisenhower did the right thing. He put me in charge of the whole north side. And he said, those of us up on the north side here had been thinking about it. We'd been thinking about it and we were ready. He gave the impression that it had been, although it was an American victory, nevertheless, it was due to the fact that he'd been invited to take over, and if he hadn't taken over, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, and he made a very unfortunate remark, uh, I think in reply to some uh, war correspondent's question, to the effect that it was one of the most interesting little battles he'd ever handled. It was another demonstration of Monty's extraordinary insensitivity to other people, to other commands, and an extraordinarily patronizing attitude toward the American command. It was though a uh, teacher had come to, to teach us. General Bradley never forgave him. Monty crossed the Rhine on the 23rd of March, 1945, with three Allied armies, British, Canadian, and American, certain he could take Berlin before the Russians. But the Americans could not bear the thought of Monty taking Berlin. They now insisted that all American armies should end the war under American command. Eisenhower then sent Stalin a secret message giving the German capital to the Russians. He now turned his American troops south to occupy southern Germany. Monty, deprived of his American army, faced a long, hard fight across northern Germany. He had to reach the Baltic in time to stop his Russian allies from occupying Denmark. He made it, but with only six hours to spare. It was victory, but not the triumphant march into Berlin, which he'd wanted. At this moment, Monty's headquarters on Lüneburg Heath became the center of the world stage. A delegation arrived from the German high command to see him. And he walked down the steps and walked across and he saluted them. And he said to the first fellow who was a sailor, who are you? And he said, I'm General Admiral von Friedeberg, commander and chief of the fleet. And the chief, just as quick as a flash, went back, I've never heard of you. And he did this down the line. He just humiliated these people. And he, uh, they came in, really, they read a big thing. And uh, what they really wanted to do, they were afraid of their women, with the Russians. Their women and children, they'd been given all kinds of publicity, I suppose, about it. And they wanted to try and make a deal of some kind. 
he started out by saying, you know, your Marshal Gehring was a very brave man. He sent his bombers over in the middle of the night and he bombed a little town called Coventry. He blew it off the face of the earth. And what did he kill? He killed the women and children. And he didn't kill the men because they were away fighting. And he said, you should have thought of this thing six years ago, not now. We're not going to stop anything. And we've got the wherewithal to do it. And we've got Air Force with 10,000 bombers. We're going to keep on killing Germans. Unconditional surrender. He wasn't making any deal. The Germans were given 24 hours to surrender. When they returned the next day, Monty had personally summoned the world's press to witness his moment of glory. They were brought into the tent where the press were. Uh, they came in. He came in right after them with his uniform on and all his decorations and everything. I will now read out the terms of that instrument of surrender. And he said, here's the instrument of surrender, which he read out, and he had it, uh, theirs in German. The and uh, he said, now you come sign. General Admiral von Friedeberg uh, will uh, sign first. <coughs> <clears throat> now, uh, General Kinsall will sign next. <clears throat> Red Admiral Wagner will sign next. Now, I will sign the instrument on behalf of the Supreme Allied Commander, uh, General Eisenhower. They all signed it, and then he signed it. That was the end of the war. Monty was the hero of the hour, already a field marshal, soon to be a Viscount. He'd liberated the peoples of occupied Europe and the people paid tribute to him. Monty reveled in it. He had fought for this moment for six years, in a personal sense far longer. The unloved colonial son had become a world figure, decorated in every country. But behind it all, there was now the fear that others might steal his glory. It was to be his, and his alone. He distanced himself from old friends. Above all, he feared his family. I think his family knew him too well. Uh, they, they, they knew him, and he couldn't quite project his image in the way he wished to, you know. He, he found it uh, difficult. To, I don't know why he minded us. We were all quite harmless and couldn't do him any harm. But he did keep us out. He, he made quite sure. When Monty was given the freedom of Newport, his mother was determined to be there. She arrived to take part on the same day. She didn't, did, not, did not go with Bernard. But he had heard that she wanted to go and had asked to go. He was determined she should not be there. And when she came to the door, she was not allowed to enter. So she said, oh, just send a message to the field marshal and say that his mother is here. He sent a message back and you were not to come in and he would not allow her to attend and she physically was, a, was not allowed in. This of course created much hardship and great hoo-ha and the affair became known as the great scandal in our family, the Newport scandal. When she died soon after, he said he was too busy to attend her funeral. As military governor in Germany, he had 23 million people to look after. Many were refugees, millions were starving. But the war had taken its toll on Monty too. Exhausted and unwell, he decided to take a holiday in Switzerland. The modern command car gives way to an old-fashioned sleigh as Field Marshal Montgomery arrives at Gustad, a famous Swiss skiing resort, for a well-earned break from his duties. It was during this stay that Monty met a 12-year-old Swiss boy, Lucien Trube. They soon became friends, and even the reaction of the world press didn't disturb Monty's newfound happiness. He needed to express love and affection, at last he could. 
He said, well, now we're good friends, so from now on you will write me on the first of every month and tell me about all the progress you're making and how, how things are coming along. So this way, this uh, very peculiar correspondence, which ended up lasting 25 years, started out. So I would obligingly write about uh, my uneventful uh, life as, uh, as a schoolboy. And uh, invariably, almost always by return mail, came his answer in a very affectionate tone. Monty missed Lucien and asked him to have a photograph specially taken. Monty thanked me very much for it and uh, added the uh, very uh, nice uh, touching words that uh, he had put up that, uh, that picture into a frame and uh, it was standing on his nightstand and he was always seeing it when he woke up in the morning. The next year Monty returned to London to become CIGS, the head of the British Army. He'd reached the highest rank possible but was increasingly lonely. He used to ring up and say he'd like to come to lunch and he'd seen that my husband was out that day and he would like to have cold ham and rice pudding. It's fixed in my mind because it was always the same. And I said, well, we don't really very much like cold ham and rice pudding. Can we have something else? And he said, yes. So he used to come to lunch and have cold ham and rice pudding and my daughter and I would eat something else. Because I think he, like all people, needed family life and the wives and children of his staff, whom he knew well, were the nearest thing he could get to it. I mean, he didn't know us particularly well, but he'd known my husband for a great many years. You know, and I think it was an ordinary sort of family house, which was what he needed. But more and more, his thoughts and emotions were directed towards Lucien. The following winter, he took him on holiday in the Alps. This holiday was certainly one of the great high points of my life because here I was, a little uh, schoolboy, getting all this tremendous attention of the great British Field Marshal. One day he had the uh, brilliant idea that I should pose in his Field Marshal's uniform uh, for him. So he got me the battle dress and the beret and I put it on and uh, at least a dozen pictures were taken uh, in the garden, in the snow, in all kinds of, uh, of funny poses, uh, just uh, playing uh, a miniature uh, field marshal.